and our pain our blue our beautiful our hard our messy our ugly our struggles and our joys God is with us God accompanying us God alongside us God amid us God among us God beside us God by us God including us God near us God plus us God upon us God as companion to us side by side us, God in the thick of us, in the thick of our humanity, in the middle of this weary world, God is with us. God is with us this morning. Let's stand and worship him. So we know. 
You can be seated. Thank you so much. It's in that song, in that song is everything we're looking at this weekend. And Lincoln wanted to be part of the talk this weekend. So uh, thank you for joining us. Come on, buddy. Seriously, we're in a series called On God. And it's all about reminding us of the realities and the truths of who God is and who he can be and wants to be in our life and how it can change life. And all of us need to experience it. And I love how that song just states it so clearly. In your presence, God, is our strength. It's reminding us in that song, God is with us, God is with us. And in his presence is our strength which is why so often we don't experience his strength. It's because though he is always present, we don't experience it as we ought to. We don't recognize and embrace it as we ought to. And the truth is, it's fair. I mean, in light of all the injustices and the suffering and the hurts and the pain that we experience in this world, I mean, it's, it's hard to embrace the idea that God is with us without huge questions looming in our mind. And uh, one thing we try to be here at Northridge is just absolutely honest about the reality we face as human beings. And all of the injustice in the world kind of brings up one big question for all of us as human beings. Where is God in all of this? And there are many different little answers to it, but I think there are three common answers, three common responses that all of us can fit into, and maybe multiple ones at the same time, but two are negative and very natural when we wonder where God is in light of the darkness and injustice, and one is very positive and very unnatural. The first group of people kind of respond to injustices and the idea, the question, where is God, by saying, there is no God. I mean, how can there be a God? I mean, even human beings can be better than this. If, if we had power, we would do more with it than he's doing. And so they, they literally ultimately deny the idea of God in light of the injustices and the suffering and the difficulties in this world. And so the first response is one of rejection. Reject God in total. Reject the idea of God more often than not. The, the second response is basically from people who can't reject or dismiss the concept of God, but they constantly wrestle with the agony of trying to fit God into a world of injustice. And so they, they ask, how could God allow this? I mean, how can he allow it? And their response is one of anger. And I actually believe this is where the majority of people are. Even those who claim they don't believe in God, they've totally rejected his idea, they, <clears throat> they're too passionately angry to not believe in him. They're just so disappointed that they just, oh, filled with anger. And whether it's overt or covert, many of us harbor some of that anger. Where were you when this happened? Where were you when this happened? Where are you now as I experienced this or my loved one experienced this or life is falling apart in this way? And so there's rejection and there's anger. And then there's the third response. And this is the positive response and very unnatural. And it's, it's a smaller group of people if we're really, really honest. These are the people who, in light of the injustices and suffering, don't claim that they understand everything that God's doing because they don't. They, they don't claim to particularly like everything God is doing because they don't, but they trust him anyway. And that's their response. Not to reject him, not to allow anger to rule in their spirit, but to, with all of their questions and with all of the wonder and complexity that it brings, they trust him anyway. And I just think I need to say it. As simple as the truth, God with us, sounds, it's at the foundation of everything we need for as human beings. It's at the foundation of everything we're ultimately looking for as human beings, to 
recognized, embrace, and experience that God is with us. And if we don't get to the place where we can let go of the rejection and let go of the anger and trust him anyway, we'll never experience the fullness that we long for and are looking for. We just won't. It's impossible. Which communicates the importance of the truth that we're looking at this weekend. God is everywhere and always present. Sounds so simple. It's the answer and remedy to everything we need. And just so you know, the Bible is filled with this truth. God wants us to know that he is everywhere and always present. When we ask, where is God? Even when we're confused, even when we hate what's happening, even when we're in the midst of the tsunami of injustice, he wants us to realize that even there he is present. Look at Psalm 139, verses 7 and 8. Where can I go from your spirit, God? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, yep, you're there. If I make my bed in the opposite place, in the depths, yep, you're there. He's everywhere and always present. Where is God? Present. Acts 17 takes another look at it, verses 27 and 28. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. And then this is the operative phrase, though he is not far from any of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. If God was not everywhere and always present, we wouldn't live, move, or have our being. He is present. He is the source of life. And the problem with our world is not the result of God's absence or God's lack of concern, it's that people don't recognize his presence. And this is exactly how the destructive forces get unleashed into our lives, into our relationships, and into this world. It's what keeps us from overcoming them in our lives, not recognizing his presence. And the truth is, whether you've thought about this or not, we can sing a song, God with us, your presence is my strength. We can worship with, we can feel good about it, we can celebrate it, and still not be experiencing the reality of it. It changes us when we experience his presence. And I, I have to, as I was crafting the idea of this truth of God, I had to evaluate my own life, and I want to encourage you to do the same. I, I'm not really asking you, do you believe that God is present? I'm wanting you to ask yourself, how your life is different because you're experiencing his presence. Because if the reality and truth of God isn't changing you, what point is there in it? It's just fairy tale. And so let's get right at the application. How does it affect us? If we're going to experience the life God designed for us, then we have to recognize and embrace his presence in our lives. I mean, we have to recognize it and not just recognize it, embrace it in our lives. John 10, 10, Jesus said, I have come. I have become present. I've come to be with you so that you can experience life and you can experience it in all of its fullness. God's presence leads to the fullness, the lives that we're so often missing and longing for. I, I have a personal example of this with my dad. I my human dad. My dad wasn't perfect. No dad is. Well, except, well, I was, but no other dad is. Yeah, right. So, but my dad was a great dad. He, he, he wanted to be present in my life. He wanted to contribute so much to my life, wisdom and, you know, resource and all that stuff. But for some odd reason, and I know a lot of young people do this, but I, I am, I in a big way, I, I kind of thought he was in my way more than he was a help. I thought of him more as a roadblock instead of a runway to life. And, and so I, I literally, this wonderful man who wanted to be present in my life, I pushed him away and ignored him in my life. And it was my loss. My dad's now been gone 20 years, and the good news is towards the end of his life, he and I had a great relationship, and I cherish it, but I, I regret that I didn't experience the beauty of his presence in my life earlier, and it wasn't because of him, it was because of me. And this is how it is 
between us and God. God longs to be in your life. God longs to support you. God longs to guide you. God longs to have you experiencing what he created you to experience, but until you recognize him, stop ignoring him, stop pushing him away, you'll never experience it. And I think the only way we re really can get at it, at least this is how my life works, is to really understand what's lost if we don't recognize and embrace his presence, what's gained if we do. And then we get to make the choice, because this is something God's given us, the freedom of choice. We get to choose, am I going to do life with him or not? Am I going to recognize his presence or ignore it and push him away? And, and I just, I really want to encourage you to recognize it, because it's the remedy to everything you're looking for. And in fact, let's just walk through that. Experiencing God's presence is the remedy for purposelessness and emptiness in life. And the world is filled with this. And you might not use these particular words, but it's something that you're wrestling with in life because all of us want lives of meaning. All of us want lives of shape, of purpose, and none of us want to be empty. In fact, it's the emptiness that causes us to keep taking and taking, trying to find some sense of fullness and always being disappointed. But when you recognize and experience God's presence, it gives you immediate purpose and meaning and fullness. I love how Solomon wrote about it in Ecclesiastes. He's the assumed writer of this book. And just so you know, to understand Ecclesiastes, the Old Testament book, you have to know that God allowed him to write a book about life as a human being on the horizontal plane without any view of God at all. It's about the horizontal plane, how we can find fullness, how we can live life, not looking to God, but through life. And it was a big disappointment. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, starting with verse 10. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. He was a king. He was rich. He could do anything he wanted, and he did it. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. I pursued it. I found it. I secured it. I experienced it. Everything you could dream about, I did, is what he's saying. My heart took delight in all my work, and it was successful, and this was the reward of all my labor. Yet, when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. My dad reached a place in his life when he was 37 where every dream he'd had of life he had surpassed. All the dreams that he thought would bring him the fullness and the meaning in life that he thought he'd find in them had been fulfilled and yet he was still empty, chasing the wind and meaningless. It sent him on a quest just like Solomon, just like the writer of Ecclesiastes. You see, you can have everything in life and you'll still be without purpose and empty until you realize God's presence. And that's exactly what he did at the end of this book after doing everything in life to try and find what he was looking for without God. Look at how he ends it in chapter 12, verse 13. Now all has been heard. I've done it all. Chasing the wind, meaningless is what it was. Here's the conclusion I've come to. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of mankind. He's saying there's only one thing that'll bring purpose and meaning and fullness to your life, and it's recognizing God's presence. Are you? Experiencing God's presence goes deeper. It's the remedy for loneliness, the destructive force that's just plaguing us in our world, and it was highlighted big time during the pandemic and the shutdown, and it's still going on in so many lives. I've done so much reading on this about how people shut away, just start to shrivel up and get filled with despair and life loses its color and man, we know what that's like. It's a destructive force and loneliness can lead to bad choices because to overcome the destructive force of loneliness will do just about anything. And many have. Acts chapter 7, 7 verse 9 says, because the patriarchs, these are the fathers of the faith, were jealous of their brother Joseph. He was the dad's favorite. They sold him as a slave into Egypt. Isn't it interesting how just a matter of fact that verse is? <laughs> These guys, the patriarchs of the faith, were jealous of their brother Joseph, and so they sold him 
as a slave. I mean, they, I just so you know, this is good news because they wanted to kill him. They decided on the better alternative. They sold their brother as a slave. But the next phrase is what you need to get. In the worst circumstance, in the worst behavior of humanity, in the place where you should experience unconditional love and instead you experience unconditional hatred, look what it says. God was still with him. God is everywhere and always present, even in the worst circumstance of life. And it was because Joseph recognized God's presence that loneliness didn't destroy him. He stayed faithful and he accomplished unbelievably big things. One of my favorite characters in the Bible. Experiencing God's presence is the remedy for fear. Fear is a plague of humanity. Fear is something we all have to deal with. Fear is alive and well on planet Earth that dominates most of our lives. The fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of loss, the fear of the unknown. But when we're dominated by fear, it's because we're realizing that we can't do it. Things are bigger than we are. But if we're recognizing God's presence, why would we be afraid? And that's exactly what the Bible says. Look at Psalm 46, verses 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength. And he is an ever-present, everywhere and always present help, even in trouble like Joseph experienced. Therefore, if God's really present, we will not fear. Psalm 118, verse 6, the Lord is with me. So I will not be afraid if God is really present and I'm embracing it and experiencing it and realizing it, I will not be afraid because what can mere mortals do to me? I, I want to give you this phrase and hopefully it will encourage you like it has me. God is bigger than whatever you fear. And when you're recognizing and embracing his presence, you're not afraid. Why would you be? You're recognizing his presence. It's not just the remedy for fear. It's the remedy for worry, for anxiety. This is big. Realize worry stems from the same thing fear stems from, the realization that we're not in control. Fear and worry stem from the realization that we're unable. We can't do it. We can't stop it. We can't overcome it. We can't protect ourselves from it. It's going to take us down. But you need to know God is neither unable or out of control. He's always in control. He's always able. So if we're really recognizing and embracing his presence, no matter how bad the circumstances, we know God's there and he's in control. And God's there and he's able. I mean, look at Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Paul says this very thing. Don't be anxious. Don't be paralyzed with worry about anything. Instead, in everything, by prayer and petition, where we're recognizing and embracing God's presence, his ability, that he's in control. And in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, you're saying, God, you're present. You're bigger than all this stuff that I'm, I'm afraid of and that's causing anxiety in my life. And when you do that, recognize and embrace it, look what he says in verse 7, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus in the midst of the most turbulent injustice, suffering, and trouble. When you recognize God's presence, you have a peace that passes understanding. Let me ask you, is this where you've been living lately? You may have been wondering why... <clears throat> I decided to bring Lincoln on the platform this weekend, and um, it should become obvious to you now. Um, this is peace that passes understanding right here. <clears throat> all Lincoln needs, and this is fact, all Lincoln needs is to know he's with me. I don't know how many of you have dogs like this, but thousands of people right here, all kinds of things that can grab his attention, all kinds of things going on, and he could give a flip because he's with me. And can I, can I just tell you the reason I'm bringing this illustration up? I brought it up before. In fact, 
It was about a year ago that I first used this illustration because I had never had Lincoln on the platform with me like this, but then pandemic hit, shutdown happened, you all were gone, all I was doing was speaking to a camera and so Lincoln hung with me and I looked down in the middle of a talk one time with all the anxiety, it was palpable for all of us, with all the things that were causing fear, with all the things going on in the world. And Lincoln was just like this at my feet. And so you can see, this is last year. In the worst of the worst, he could care less because he was with me. And this is how it's supposed to be with us and God. When you recognize God's presence and experience it, it's the remedy for fear and it's the remedy for worry. Are you experiencing it? Seriously, I want to be like Lincoln when I grow up. <clears throat> I mean, the guy doesn't care. Pretty soon he's going to be licking himself in untold regions right in front of you, and he won't care because I'm right here with him. When we experience God's presence, it's the remedy for destructive choices. And here's the truth. We make really bad choices when we feel like no one's watching. You do. I do. I mean, it's the way we are. And it's not just us, by the way. It's everyone. Look at James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves then to God. Recognize his presence. He's in control. You're not. He's able. You're not. So yield yourself to him. Submit to him. And then, because now you're in his strength and not your own, you can resist the devil as powerful and as devastating of a force as he is, you can resist him and he'll flee from you. And not just the enemy, the devil, but all of your enemies, all of your devils, all of the things you fight, all of the things you wrestle with, every single thing that's stronger than you and more powerful than you, if you submit yourself to God, recognizing and embracing his presence, you can tell that to be gone because God's bigger. It helps us to overcome destructive choices, which even the best of us need. The, the truth is, the temptation that leads to bad choices has great power over all of us when we think God isn't watching or doesn't exist. Moses was a great man of God, but he too was flawed and human, and man, did he blow it when he forgot that God was present. All right, let me read you a passage. Look at Exodus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. One day, Moses saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, an Egyptian beating one of God's people, a Hebrew, one of Moses' own people. So look at what Moses did. This is so human. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one watching, what did he do? He did what he wouldn't have done if someone was watching. He killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand because no one was watching. He could when we feel no one's watching, it's so easy, so natural to make bad choices. But the truth is someone's always watching. Moses' failure wasn't that he didn't look left and right. It was that he didn't look up. He didn't recognize God's presence. Is that what's going on in your life these days? And it's not just Moses. David, another man of God, a man after God's own heart, God himself said, Man, he lived a great life, but he blew it whenever he forgot God's presence. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 and 4. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. He was a king. He could do anything he wanted. He was a king. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. And just so happens, this woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. And the man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? And then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. He was a king. He could do what he wanted. I don't know if you notice this. He didn't even look to the left or the right. He was a king. He could get his servants who were watching to go fetch her and bring her to him. He could do anything he wanted because in this moment he forgot one thing. While he was king over his people, there was a king over him. And he failed to recognize God's presence, and it led to a destructive choice that haunted David the rest of his life. The same happens to us. Hey, here's the question I have for you. What are you, what are you currently doing in your life 
that requires you to forget or to ignore God's presence. You know what it is. You, you know who you are when no one's watching. The only problem is someone's watching. God's present. What's your palace roof where you feel like you've got authority over it and control over it and you can do whatever you want, but in the end, it's going to take you down? Recognizing and embracing God's presence is the remedy for it. Experiencing God's presence is the remedy for bitterness and anger, which is it's a plague on the level of loneliness these days. Everybody seems to be filled with anger and bitterness in life. It's just controlling and destroying. And, and if we're honest, can we just admit it? There are a lot of reasons to be angry and bitter. I mean, life is totally unfair but when we recognize and embrace God's presence, it removes the bitterness and anger because though we don't understand everything and though we don't particularly like everything, rather than rejecting God and being angry with God, we trust Him anyway. And it helps when we remember that if God is present, then He's working good. In fact, knowing he's present and recognizing his presence is the only way we can live Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every other form of malice. Instead, be the opposite. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Why? Because everybody's treating each other right? No. Forgiving one another. In other words, in the middle of experiencing injustice, mistreatment, disappointment, betrayal, the things that are unforgivable... Instead of being angry and bitter, be kind and compassionate. How? By forgiving each other. And how do you do that? Just as in Christ God forgave you by recognizing God's presence. Do you realize I do not deserve God's presence around my life or in my life, but I can have his presence around my life and in my life because he loves me anyway. Why should you trust him anyway? Because he loves you anyway because he'll forgive you anyway. It's just a big deal. Experiencing God's presence is the remedy for guilt, which all of us carry a healthy dose of. I mean, we all carry a healthy dose of guilt. We've all blown it. We've all failed. I mean, our natural incl inclination to solve our guilt, our shame problem is that we try to deny it, we try to hide from it, we try to run from it, we try to justify it, but it doesn't work. It doesn't matter how much you think I'm not guilty. If I'm guilty and unforgiven, I'm filled with darkness even though you see me with a halo of light, though no one's ever accused me of having a halo of light. You get the point. We can kid each other, but we can't kid ourselves. This is where David was. We have to recognize God's presence. Our natural inclination is to hide from God, but that's because we think we can hide from God. But when we've blown it, he already knows. And the only way we're going to overcome and not allow our failure to be final, the only way is by acknowledging it to one who already knows and letting him forgive us. Look at, look at how it worked with David, who sinned on his palace roof by seizing Bathsheba. Look at what he did in Psalm 32, just two of the verses. When I kept silent, when I hid it, when I denied it, when I created the image of being a man after God's own heart, but I was filled with guilt within, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, God, though people didn't know it, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. So what did he do? He recognized and embraced God's presence. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Instead of hiding from God, he opened himself up to God and let God forgive him. Have you been there? Because David is us. We're David. Many of us have allowed our failure, our guilt, our shame to be final. And so this remedy is for you and me. 
Because all of us know guilt. All of us, Romans 3.23 says, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're guilty. And just so you know, even though we can escape from judgment from one another by hiding it, God's Spirit always brings it to the surface. The God who you deny is present is present and bringing it to the surface. Look at John 16, 8. When he, God's Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to their sin, in regard to righteousness, and regard to judgment. God's Spirit continues to point our guilt out, to bring it to the surface. Why, is he just mean? No, because as long as we're hiding it, it's destroying us within like it did David. But when we bring it to the surface and face it and acknowledge it, with David we can experience forgiveness from God. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It's the point of Jesus dying on the cross is so we could be forgiven of our sin. It's the point of his resurrection so we could be given a new life. Your failures don't have to be final, but to experience their forgiveness and freedom from them, you have to recognize his presence, stop hiding, and confess. Have you? Can I just say, it's true that our world is filled with a lot of harsh and negative realities, injustice and suffering, just a couple. But it doesn't have to destroy us. And you need to know it's not the ultimate problem we face, which is probably the best way to bring this talk into a landing so that we can respond with worship. But what is our ultimate problem? It's not the injustice, it's not the suffering, it's not the trouble, it's not the difficulty, it's not our failure. That's not the ultimate problem. The ultimate problem is failing to recognize God's presence. Trying to live without recognizing his presence, trying to hide from him, run from him, reject him, deny him, be angry at him, it's just ridiculous. Genesis 28, 16, I think, defies the, the natural state of humanity. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely, the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. Surely the Lord was in this place. I am telling you, the truth is that God is everywhere, always present. He is not just in this place we call church, a sanctuary, an auditorium. He is everywhere and always present. He was there in your worst moment, in your worst choice, in your worst experience. He was there. He is here. He always is. But the problem is we're not aware of it. And it's when we're not aware of his presence that we experience fear and worry and guilt and anger and bitterness and all the destructive forces we experience. It's when we're failing to recognize his presence that we don't have the peace that passes understanding like Lincoln where, you know, what would it do him to be up here going, ah, people, ah, 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 ah. it would do nothing. You'd just laugh and think it was cute and take pictures and put it on social media. It'd do nothing for him. It does nothing for us. Why not just rest in the arms, in the promises, in the reality of God's presence? You have to recognize it, which brings us to the ultimate solution. If the ultimate problem is failing to recognize God's presence, then, man, our ultimate solution is acknowledging his presence and inviting him into our lives. He's present. You don't have to scream for God. You don't have to play hide-and-seek with God. All you have to do is recognize his presence. I think Jesus said it so well in Revelation 3.20, and I'm sure he's up there saying, well, thanks, Brad, for thinking I said something well. That's really good, but... Look at Revelation 3.20. Here I am, I stand at the door of your life and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. When does he do this? Always. I don't know who you are, where you've been, what you're experiencing now, what your thoughts are about God, life, about anything, but I do know this. God's present, pursuing you. Loving you. Knocking. Just like my dad was in my life. My dad wanted in. And I shut him out. It was me, not him. 
And so many of us are angry at God, and we don't understand that God's just loving us there, knocking. And all we have to do is let him in. And so in this moment, I'm asking you, stop ignoring him, stop pushing him away, stop rejecting him, stop letting anger paralyze you, and just recognize that he's knocking and open your life to him and let him change you. And just before we move into worship, I want to pray with you. So would you bow with me in a word of prayer wherever you are at this moment? And if you already have a relationship with Jesus, I want to encourage you, be inviting him back into your life. Recognize his presence. Let it be the remedy for what you're experiencing. But if you're here and you've never experienced him, pray with me now, would you? Recognize his presence for the first time and invite him in. Just take my words and make them yours to God. Just say, Jesus, I believe you're present around me, but I need you to be present in me. I don't deserve you. I, I'm guilty. I've failed. I've sinned. But you died on the cross to forgive me. And so right now, I'm opening the door of my life and by faith asking you to forgive my sin and make me new. I'm asking in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just prayed with me, I really want to encourage you to let us know so we can celebrate, yes, but more than that, so that we can send you information about next steps you can take to build this relationship with God that you just began. And all you have to do is follow the directions on the screen, text us to that number, and the one message, word message is Northridge, and we'd love to send you that information. But this week, there's a special opportunity for you. If you want to take a next step, if you want to learn more about Jesus and the role he can play in your life and how you can know him better and how we as a church try to organize to support and encourage that, this Friday night, I'm doing a little thing we call Discover Northridge. It's just where we talk about how we as a church are trying to help people to know Jesus better and what we're about and connecting to the, that to you. It's, it's with no obligation. We'd love for you to come. We just need to know you're coming. The good news this week, for the first time ever, we're doing it all online virtually. We're going to do it on Zoom, and it's going to be a fun, interesting experience, and I hope that You'll just follow the directions on the screen and you'll sign up for it and that I'll be able to see you on Friday night. But getting our hearts ready for worship this weekend, I want to leave you with this thought. I want to encourage you to never forget that there's nothing, nothing worth more. There's nothing that will ever come close and there's nothing that can ever compare to God's presence in our lives. Nothing. It's the ultimate solution, the ultimate remedy. It's what we're all looking for. So you need to know when you remember God's presence and you trust him anyway, all of our fear and worry and anxiety and anger and bitterness and doubt is replaced with what? Worship. Because he's able because he's present, because he's in control even when we're not. So I can't think of a better way to respond to this truth and all it can mean to us than right now, recognizing he's with us, responding by trusting him and letting trust lead us together to worship. If you're in the room and you're able to stand, please stand with us. Let's worship together. If you're watching online, come on, make the place where you are a place where God can dwell. Lord, we acknowledge you. There's nothing better than your presence, Jesus. Let's sing together. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close no thing can compare you're our living hope your presence lord i've tasted 
tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord come on won't you help us sing Holy Spirit Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory God is what our hearts long for to be overcome by your presence Lord
to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Come on, Northridge, as a sign of surrender. All over the room, won't you lift your hands in the air? Come on. Jesus, Jesus. We're going to sing this. It says, let us become more aware of your presence, God. That is our prayer today. We want to know that you're with us, God. Come on, let's sing this together. Let us become more aware of your presence. That's our prayer today. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Come on, let's celebrate them today. Hallelujah.
that's calling on your name, Jesus. Your name has power. Your name is a strong tower, Jesus. Come on, won't you help me call this name? Somebody just shout out the name of Jesus. 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 Jesus, we need you. Jesus, we've come here to worship you. We've come here to lavish praise on you, Jesus. For you are our only hope. You are our help, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. sweet presence here today. Take a moment and be still in the presence of Jesus. At the mention of the name of Jesus, fear has to bow. At the mention of the name of Jesus, depression has to flee. At the mention of the name of Jesus, anxiety has to flee. At the mention of the name of Jesus, healing happens. At the mention of the name of Jesus, there's power in the name of Jesus. We want to continue in this atmosphere of worship by receiving an offering. We give because we believe in the name of Jesus. We believe in what God is doing here through this church around the world. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for his great love. We thank you for his presence in our lives. You've given us such grace and such mercy. And so we take this this time right now, we count it a privilege and an honor to give back to your kingdom so that we can continue to wake the world up to who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing and continue worshiping with us. Come on, put your hands together. We're going to raise the praise in here. We're going to lift up a hallelujah louder than we ever have before. Come on, let's sing. You know we're singing with us. I raise a hallelujah. Down a thing the unbelief. It's real simple. I raise. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. My weapon is a melody.
sing a little louder. Yeah. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Oh, sing a little louder. Everybody lift your voice. Sing a little louder.